get it going here. I want to talk to you tonight about uh, making non-protein substances. So we've already talked about making those protein substances and how we regulate when those protein substances are made through gene expression regulation. But we have a lot of chemicals that are actually not going to be proteins. And so they're not coded directly in the genome. And we have to understand a little bit about how we make those non-protein substances. So what are some examples of these non-protein substances? Well, we have a variety of hormones that are called steroid hormones. This includes things like estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, the glucocorticoids, and the mineral corticoids. And these are actually going to be derived from cholesterol. And cholesterol is not a protein product. It's actually a uh, chemically considered a lipid. So steroids, uh, other lipids themselves, the phospholipids that make up the uh, cell membrane and uh, organelle membranes. Also, um, there's a series of chemicals known as pigments that are going to be used in a variety of biological uh, systems. One of the most common pigment that we have is melanin that sets over the nucleus <coughs> that we find in the cells that make our skin to protect the nucleus from UV radiation, ultraviolet radiation from the sun. So how do we actually generate these types of molecules if they don't have a protein product? And the answer is, is there's actually going to be protein products that help to produce these. You probably should be thinking in terms of enzymes. So each of these molecules, we actually have enzymes that are going to be required. And those enzymes are going to be proteins that are actually going to be coded in the DNA. Okay, so even though we don't have a gene for testosterone, we have a gene called aromatase, which is an enzyme that takes testosterone and converts it into estrogen. So we can generate um, those, those uh, molecules from having the enzyme that is going to be present. Uh, a lot of these, too, you're actually going to consume in your diet. And so some of these chemicals and enzymes are actually going to help to transport the molecules into the body, across the digestive wall, into the bloodstream, to be circulated to where they're required and where they're going to be needed. All right, the last topic. Well, I guess i got two more topics here to talk about before we move on. Um, the next topic that I want to address is going to be replication, and specifically replication of our DNA. So why would we actually need to replicate our DNA? Why do we need to copy our DNA? Well, every time we add new cells, we have to make sure that we have an exact copy of our DNA that gets to go into that cell so that all of our cells contain the exact same DNA what regulate through gene expression which proteins are going to be produced. So if it's a brain cell, it has the same DNA as if it's a stomach cell or a cell that we find in the skeletal muscle or the kidneys or the liver or any place. And it's going to be replication that helps to deal with this process. Now, to, to start replication, the DNA molecule, which you're going to remember is associated with proteins called histones. We first have to free the DNA from those histones. We have to make sure basically that we can access the DNA sequence, the DNA molecule itself, so that we can bring in the right enzymes to help this process occur. So if I just sort of draw out a DNA molecule here that's stripped of its histones or is no longer associated with its histones, I'm going to have the two strands. I'm going to have what are called the template and the non-template strands. Okay, so these are just the two strands of DNA. And I need to get in. This is where the base pairs are going to sit. I need to get in and I need to be able to read those base pairs. So the DNA actually is going to be initially unzipped. And as it gets unzipped, there's a, a series of enzymes that does this so that we can actually expose the individual nucleotides in the DNA molecule. 
Okay, so first it gets unzipped, and this whole thing here, if you can kind of use your imagination, it looks a little bit like a fork, right? which you would eat with. It only has two tines, but it still has a resembles a fork. And so we actually call this structure, we call that structure the replication fork. Okay, so we first remove the histones, we dissociate the DNA from the histones, and then we form this thing called the replication fork. And the replication fork, uh, the enzyme here is an enzyme called helicase that basically helps to unwind the DNA and to separate and melt the, the nucleotides uh, that are bound together to form. In all practical purposes, even though it's all still attached together, you basically end up with two single strands of DNA. Okay, And they're going to have opposite sequences, right? If there's an A over here on this side, I'm going to have a T over on this side. So I'm exposing that DNA sequence and that DNA code. So now I can come in and I can read it. And I have other enzymes that are going to come in and read it. One of the big ones is going to be DNA polymerase. And you know that it's an enzyme because it's ASE. And then polymer means that it's going to take and produce a new polymer or a new molecule of DNA containing many nucleotides. Okay, so DNA polymerase is actually going to come up and interact with those exposed nucleotides to read the nucleotide and to insert new nucleotides, building a whole new brand new copy strand of that DNA molecule. Now, it shouldn't surprise you that the sequence of this new strand that's being built is going to be complementary to the sequence that it's being read off of. So T's are going to be A's in the new strand. G's will be C's, C's will be G's, and T's will be A's. Now, there is one issue, and if I hop back here <coughs> to my uh, replication fork, you're going to see that the strands are going to go in opposite directions. Okay, so I would read one strand in this direction, and I read one strand in this direction. It's kind of like taking a book and... Um, well, that may not be a great example. Ignore that I just said that. <laughs> Stricken from the record. Um, you would, it would be like taking a mirror and putting that mirror on, uh, on a word or on uh, a sentence, and what you see in the mirror is in the opposite direction. Okay? So this is sort of a mirror image of this up here, and so we read in, the, in two different directions. Well... Enzymes usually only read in a single, or DNA polymerase enzymes only read in a single direction. So this is a problem, because if I'm reading in this direction and in this direction with the same DNA polymerase, I'm not going to really be able to read one of those strands. But there is a way that we get around that. So we're going to read in opposite directions on opposite, opposite strands. And so taking a look at our replication fork here, the RNA polymerase or the DNA polymerase is going to come in and bind up on the DNA. And if I have my nucleotides here, as it begins to move in this direction, let's use a slightly different color it's going to begin to add in those new nucleotides, forming the new strand. Okay? And it's going to read in a continuous method. Whereas the other strand, DNA polymerase has to read in the same direction. However, the code goes in this direction. So what is actually going to happen is DNA polymerase is going to come and bind up on one portion and is going to read a small little fragment, and then it's going to relocate to another portion of the strand, and we're going to get another sequence. Okay, so I end up with a very continuous sequence here, but here I end up with fragments. And then another enzyme just comes back as they uh, connects all those fragments back together. 
these little fragments, by the way, just sort of as a, I don't know, a fun fact, maybe it'll come up in uh, trivia someday for you. Those are called Okazaki fragments. Here, let me change that to yellow. Okazaki fragments, and it was named after the team of people that discovered it. They were from Japan, and it was uh, Okazaki and his wife were the ones who discovered this mechanism, and so they're named Okazaki fragments after that discovery. All right, so. We only use a single polymerase, one polymerase, and it actually is going to follow the helicase. And let me rephrase that. Not just one polymerase, but actually one type of polymerase. There's just one DNA polymerase that's the eukaryotic cell um, replication DNA polymerase. Okay? And that one polymerase actually is going to follow the helicase. So we actually have... <coughs> That other enzyme here, I'll just draw it in sort of like this, called the helicase, that is going to take and it's going to unwind those two strands from each other. And the DNA polymerase is just going to fall in right behind it. And as it unwinds, it generates the new strand. And then behind DNA polymerase, you actually have another enzyme that zips everything back together. So it moves the, the whole thing. This is where we would have all of our activity. And you can see here's the replication fork on either side. But we really have the DNA strand on the other side kind of looking at like a replication fork. So the whole thing is known as the replication bubble. And we're just slowly moving that replication bubble. So if you were watching this, if you could actually observe it, you would see these forks forming, and it would look like this replication bubble is just sort of moving along, and you have the new strands of DNA spinning off as we move along and we seal everything up. So one polymerase or one type of polymerase follows the helicase, replicating along the way. Now you have that same type of DNA polymerase that's also putting together the Okazaki fragments working away from um, the helicase as we move along and basically is filling in the gaps on that other strand. So the other polymerase is going to create short segments in a direction away from our helicase enzyme. Again, so that creates the fragments, the Okazaki fragments. So the other strand here that's being produced by this other polymerase becomes very fragmented. Now, if we were to take a look at that strand that's just been created, it's being created in, in segments or in fragments. And so there's going to be basically the two fragments that need to be put back together. And whenever we put two pieces of DNA back together, we call that a, a ligation. And so to put those fragments together, a, another enzyme here, so we have helicase, DNA polymerase, and now DNA ligase that fills in the gaps and basically, in one sense, stitches together those Okazaki fragments. Okay, so now we got new DNA strands that are being generated. They've been produced. We got uh, what we've needed to ligate, getting ligated back together. The next thing to really happen here is going to be the histones are going to need to reassemble. Because remember, we bump them off as that replication fork and the replication bubble move through the DNA molecule. So we need to reassemble those histones, not only for the old DNA molecule that we've denuded, but also the new DNA molecule that's forming, we're going to want to associate that with histones as well so we can pack that up into our chromatin network. So the histones are reassembled. They start out in the cytosol. They get generated 
<coughs> in the cytosol, which really should surprise you, right? Because most proteins are being produced in the cytosol. But all of this, the DNA replication is occurring in the nucleus. So the cytosol is where the histones are going to be produced, and then they go to the nucleus, get transported into the nucleus to join up with the new forming uh, DNA molecule and to reassemble in the old molecule that's being replicated. Now, anyone happen to remember how many nucleotides we have in the human genome? Yeah, 3.5 billion. Okay, so let me give you an analogy here to kind of think about uh, with DNA replication. There are 3.5 billion nucleotides, so that means there are 3.5 million A's, G's, C's, and T's. If we were to look at the number, that number of letters in, in written text, like from books, the cart that I would have to bring in would be about this big. It would be a big cart, and it would be loaded with stacks and stacks of books. Okay? The analogy here is I wheel in that cart, and let's just say for uh, all intents and purposes, there to get the 3.5 billion letters from all of those different textbooks, I'd need roughly about 40 to 50 textbooks. And I would say, okay, here you go, Andrew. I need you to go through and make exact copies of all 3.5 billion of these letters from all of these books. And I want it done in six to eight hours. So how does DNA polymerase actually do this? And the way that this is actually done is we divide and conquer. And instead of just having a single DNA polymerase, you actually are going to have many DNA polymerases. So many DNA polymerases are going to replicate. And really, it's many DNA polymerases re replicating each DNA molecule in each chromosome. It takes about six to eight hours to complete the task. And so if we were to observe this under microscopy, if this was the DNA molecule, I may have thousands of individual DNA polymerases working in a very small section. And so rather than it just being Andrew, I come with those 3.5 billion words in those textbooks, and I say, everybody on Truett's campus, which is over 1,000 people, I say, everybody has to, work, has to work here. And in all reality, it's probably going to be the whole state of Georgia at 3 or 4 million people in the state, each writing about 1,000 words to get this done in about 6 or 8 hours. So we can really divide and conquer here and make this process go a lot faster. Again, six to eight hours is how long it's going to take to complete this task. Now, there are few documents that have been shown in history to have a high rate of uh, inerrancy. The Bible is actually one of them, but the Bible actually still has a few errors that can be found from a variety of the different texts, things like the Masoretic text or the Vulgate or the Septuagint, there are actually some differences. Now, let me go on also to say on record that those differences that are found, none of them have anything to do with the basic biblical doctrines that are important for biblical Christianity, just to get that out there. It's things like the name John being spelled J-O-N in one of those and J-O-H-N in another one. That's where the most common errors are. And people have estimated there's about 250,000 of those errors if you look at all the different types of manuscripts across time. Okay? That's actually compared to a lot of other texts out there. If you look at books like um, Homer's Iliad or Odyssey, they actually believe that Homer's Iliad and Odyssey are completely different texts or completely different manuscripts today compared to when they were originally written because they had a much higher rate of error. Um, now, so basically I'm telling you all of this because whenever you copy something, 
even with the most stringent controls in the human world, we make errors. I think actually one step further on all of this stuff here from God's word, because God has divine authority over his word, I think that's one of the main reasons that we don't see as high of a rate of error in the Bible that we do in a lot of our other texts from a similar time period. All right, anyways, kind of digress there a little bit. This means that whenever we copy something, we typically make errors. If we make errors in the genome, one, there are 6,000 diseases right now that have a one nucleotide, what we would call single nucleotide polymorphism. In you and I who are not sick, we have maybe a G in someone else who's deathly ill. They may have a T in that single spot out of 3.5 billion. So we have to be dead on accurate. So not only do we replicate the molecule in six to eight hours, but DNA polymerase was uniquely and beautifully designed to check and fix any errors that occur. So basically, the errors that can occur, they become known because they're biochemically unstable pairs. And the polymerase can actually detect and measure and respond to that biochemical instability. Can they do that before they move on to do other stuff? Or? Part of it is before they move on. There are also other types of DNA polymerases that that's the whole job. Mm -hmm. The estimate for the error rate in DNA polymerase DNA replication is about a one in one billion error rate. So you may accumulate three errors across your 3.5 billion nucleotides with a single replication. You know, I mentioned there are 6,000 diseases that are basically single nucleotide polymorphism diseases. Fortunately, that also is a really, really low rate. 6,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms out of 3.5 billion. So the chances of one of these errors, a one in one billion error, occurring in one of those exact replication uh, or, or SNP locations is really, really good. Really. This, by the way, <laughs> is phenomenal. Even in the world of computers, when you email a Word file or another file to another user, they actually have a higher rate of error. Now, usually you don't see that. It doesn't show up, but there is a small little error in the file. And eventually you email that file around enough, and maybe you've been on the uh, tail end of one of these email chains where a file has been emailed through 25, 30 different people. When you get that file and go to click on it, it says error corruption in file, or corruption in file detected and you can't open it. It's because of that error rate that occurs. So that, I mean, 25 people, right? 25 times you send a file around and you may occasionally get an error. That would be analogous to uh, accumulating an error that causes disease from the point of conception, how long do you think it would take? Basically, how many, so how many times, how many days or weeks or years would it take for us to go through 25 replication steps from the point of conception? When, we, when should we expect, if we have the same error rates that our technology has in our, our genome, when should we expect to have, to have that, that first error that causes disease that may even be fatal for there? You're not following what I'm asking. So, I'm saying error rates, if I take and I email you a document, and then you email Diane a document. Okay, so we can do that 25 times. So now I'm saying if we had the same rate in our DNA that the computer has, it would be analogous to replicating our DNA 25 times. And now I'm saying how many times, how long does it take to go through 25 replications from that first cell? It's about the first three days. 
conception, day one, day two, day three, you'd already have, if you had the same rate of error that our technology has, you'd already have cancer or some other type of disease. As a three day, I mean, just, yeah. Okay. Enough on that. Kind of fun to hypothesize about, I guess. Last thing we need to talk about is the life of the cell, which we would call the cell cycle. Okay, so life of the cell. Basically, cells are going to go through this process of growing, developing, and then they're going to divide to form a new cell. That's how we get growth. As you grow up, you get born, and you got to get bigger, you need more cells. You've got to develop uh, additional muscle as you go through puberty, you get more cells. So the cell cycle is this life of the cell, and basically, why is it a cycle? Well, because that's the best way for humans to model it, to really understand it. And the cell cycle, I sort of draw it right here in my cycle, we actually are going to start out with an individual cell that has uh, its known genome, and it's going to go through this process of different steps leading back until we actually form two cells that now can go through their own cell cycle. So we start out with G1, and then we go to S, then we go to G2, and then we go to mitosis and cytokinesis. Okay? So that's the cell cycle. It's going to be G1 leading to S phase, leading to G2, leading to mitosis. Now in all reality, from G1 all the way through G2, so everything excluding mitosis, G1, S, and G2, we refer to this as interphase. Okay, so that's going to be interphase. G1, S, G2, interphase. The S stands for DNA replication or DNA synthesis. Really, the S stands for synthesis. This is when our DNA is going to be synthesized. This lasts about six to eight hours. We get a second copy of our genome that can be stuck into this new forming cell. The Gs stand for gaps. And primarily, these are going to be pretty normal function. Uh, for G1, we're actually just going to simply accumulate raw nutrients during G1 and then go through a little bit of growth. During G2, following S phase, G2 is going to be a second gap phase, and basically we're going to prepare for mitosis. Do those last checks to make sure all of the nutrients that we need and all of the resources that we need to make sure that they're available. And then we'll progress from G2 into this M phase. And that M phase stands for mitosis. And you've already done some stuff with mitosis this semester. Mitosis in itself just simply refers to nuclear division. Nuclear division. Now note that I'm calling it nuclear division, and that is to be taken separate from division of everything else inside of the cell that's not the nucleus. So the cytoplasm containing all the organelles and the membrane are going to be divided up by a different process, not by mitosis. That other process is known as cytokinesis, and I'll get there in just a second. So mitosis, with uh, our nuclear division, is going to consist of four stages or steps or phases or periods, whatever you want to call them. And they are going to be prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Okay, so prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. I have four brothers. Their names are Pete, Mike, Andy, and Tom. And it just so happens that my four brothers really fit well with prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. I don't really have four brothers, but now you're going to remember that. <laughs> Pete, Mike, Andy, and Tom. He just lied to us! <laughs> 
Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so alongside telophase, this last phase here in mitosis, <laughs> we're going to have this process known as cytokinesis. And this is going to be the process that splits, splits, there we go, splits the cytoplasm. Now, cytoplasm is the term that we were we used to describe the cytosol and everything that's dissolved in the cytosol. It's just collectively known as cytoplasm. So we're going to break it apart. Cytoplasm broken up and split into the, uh, the, or, uh, into the two new forming cells. So um, I guess I'm going to have to adjust it. Is everybody, did everybody get that? <laughs> Aha! <laughs> Yes, yeah, splits the cytoplasm. Are right, we good now? Okay. So cell cycle G1, S, G2, mitosis, and alongside the telophase of mitosis, we have cytokinesis. And you you did a lot of this, right? I'm, I'm remembering correctly that you looked at Mitosis? Yeah. Oh, so we know we didn't ever look oh. at mitosis. Did you look at mitosis in DI one oh one? Why you yeah. Did you in one oh one? Okay. Um, let me let's step back real quick. I'm gonna give give you a free lecture here. Yay. What's that? Would you, you ask a, was that sarcastic or was that a serious question? It was a question. <laughs> it was a sarcastic comment. Well, you, you, you want to come off and lecture now? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so mitosis, we start out, we go through G1, S phase, double our DNA, G2, make sure we're ready to go into mitosis. And then mitosis, we basically want to establish the situation where the chromosomes are going to be split equally, right? I want to have chromosome 1 through 23, both pairs from mom and dad go into one cell, and then the other set to go into the other cell. In other words, I don't want to have like four chromosome ones in one cell and no chromosome ones in the other cell. I want to do an equal division. So prophase, if you look at it under the microscope, you actually can begin to see the beginning of the um, chromosome con condensing from the chromatin network into the chromatids. So you actually, normally, <clears throat> when you look at a cell, the nucleus is so dark that it really doesn't pass any light through it, and so it prevents light from really coming through. Then during prophase, you begin to condense, and you get some more light that passes through, and you can see that. So this is going to be my prophase. From prophase, the nuclear envelope is going to disintegrate, and we're going to have further condensation, and we're going to enter into metaphase, and the most hallmark part, part of metaphase is going to be what's called the metaphase plate. So from prophase, we go into metaphase. The chromosomes are now going to be very well condensed. And they're all going to line up in the middle called um, on the middle called the metaphase plate. And in all reality, what will happen here is they're going to pair up almost at random. Yellow is one set of chromosomes, the, the red is the other set of chromosomes. And they, set, they line up and they pair up so that you don't have all of the original chromosomes going into one and all of the new chromosomes that were formed going into the other cell. It distributes them randomly. But it distributes them in such a way that I have a set of all the chromosomes going into one cell and a set of the exact same chromosomes going into the other cell. Okay, so we form the metaphase plate. And then we begin to actually go through the process of separating. So the nucleus is still present here. The nucleus has disappeared here. It's no longer present. And then we begin to go through the process of splitting. And so if you observe this under micros microscopy, you begin to see that metaphase plate begin to unzip or break apart. And then, so this is going to be anaphase.
And then we go into telophase, and alongside telophase, we go through cytokinesis. Okay? So I'm actually going to begin to see some new nuclei form, and I'm going to begin to see those chromosomes kind of getting condensed down uh, back into the chromatin network in those nuclear envelopes that are wrapping around them. All of the stuff, the, the cell solution and all of the organelles are going to be split up. And then we're going to begin to form this thing called the cleavage furrow. And that cleavage furrow is where the uh, membrane begins to pinch off. And it's kind of like a, a stuff sack for like a sleeping bag or something like that. You know, you pull on the string and it closes down the, the opening. That's actually sort of what's happening. In fact, there's actually contractile proteins and motor proteins that go through the process of closing up or cinching down on the membrane, and then we get to a point where they just simply break apart, and now we have two brand new cells called daughter cells. Um, the distribution during cytokinesis of membrane and all of the organelles is actually not going to be totally equal. So if I have, uh, let's say I have, for uh, quantity sake, 25 mitochondria, I might get 12 mitochondria in one and 13 mitochondria in the other cell. So it's not an equal distribution or an equal split for all the organelles. But the chromosomes, they are split equally. Okay, so that's mitosis and a little bit of cytokinesis in a nutshell. Now just to finish up here with this lecture, <coughs> when we look at the cell, most of normal physiology is occurring in cells that are in G1. G1. So G1 is actually the condition of the cell most often. Cell, uh, the um, S phase is six to eight hours. G2, sometimes it can even be short as just a few minutes after S phase just to last check to make sure that everything is copacetic for the split. Mitosis is between 30 and 45 minutes, and then we go right back into G1. Okay? So G1 is where we're going to see most of the physiology. Now, there's one additional phase that is not really part of the cell cycle. So if I draw out the cell cycle, cell cycle may look something like that. And so we go G1, S, G2, mitosis, and cytokinesis. And the cells would continue to go around in that cycle, generating two daughter cells every time we rotate. So just to make sure that you really get this, if I start with one cell, how many cells would I have <coughs> after one cell cycle? Two, and then four, and then eight, and then 16, and then 32, then 64, then 128, then Two something or other, 256, 512. Anyways, um, <laughs> occasionally cells are going to stop progressing through the cell cycle and they're going to deviate. And that deviation, and, and I guess I'm not drawing that very well because it, it would deviate from up here towards G1, they go into a phase that's called G0. So this is a deviation away from the cell cycle referred to <coughs> as G0. In G0, the cells are going to be at rest. We may refer to them as being quiescent. <coughs> and really what that means is that they don't proceed to division any longer. Or they may actually slip into G0 for a prolonged period of time and then slip back into uh, the cell cycle and continued progression. In fact, next, whenever you take A and P2, you're going to talk about the female reproductive system. And in the female reproductive system, at birth, you will have about a million to two million ovum in the ovary at the time of birth, all of them in G0. And then at puberty, they get switched back into the cell cycle and begin through the ovulatory process. <coughs> 